Welcome to Office Baggage, where two corporate women unpack our week in business. Every week, co-hosts Ray Parent and Marcy Tweet tackle the WTF business topics you want to talk about on every rung of the business ladder. Bring your baggage. We'll We'll unpack it. This week on Office Baggage, we're joined by our first man in a while, Matt Warzel, the head of MJW Careers, to talk about resume red flags. You need to hear his tips for getting it right on your resume. So welcome back to Office Baggage. I'm incredibly excited to be here today with Matt Warzel, the president of MJW Careers. And we're going to talk today about everything from resumes to interviewing, the whole shebang. Matt helps people really work through their career coaching, outplacement, resume writing, all of those things. So Matt, let's jump in and and tell us a little bit about, about you and about MJW Careers before we jump into the meat of our questions. Well, thank you, Marcy. I appreciate your time and uh, having me on today to speak with your listeners. And uh, I've been doing this for over 15 years. I kind of cut my teeth uh, with staffing, Aerotech, the owner of the Ravens, started that company back in the uh, 90s. And uh, a wonderful company to really learn the ins and outs of staffing, recruiting, talent acquisition. So I was that's been all my HR experience coming up was solely finding people work and having kind of doing that day to day, you realize that you, you know, you kind of interview coach and you resume, right, but you don't have that title, so to speak. So um, I found that um, after I went through the staffing phase and really kind of honed in on the processes of hiring manager and personalities and to do's and what not to do's and everything uh, across the gamut, whether it's, um, you know, staffing or internal HR recruiting, um, the meltdown hit and I realized, you know, we're expendable as recruiters. If no one's hiring, even though there's always someone hiring during times like this. Right. I'll say that right now, but uh, for, for lack of better terms, if no one's hiring, you know, they'll get rid of us recruiters. So um, kind of down on my luck, uh, ha- you know, had some bouts with some things and, and just kind of didn't know what to do with my life. And um, I thought, well, let, let me just kind of start resume writing. You know, I've been doing this for a while. I'll just, you know, 60 bucks, try to knock out a resume for people. And, and it, you know, it kind of grew into this 10 year business that I have now. And I hate, I apologize in advance for any listeners that got a resume from me back in 2009. <laughs> um, we were all learning, but again, hiring managers might've been a little different then too. So who knows? But um, you know, I, I kind of definitely honed in on what I think is a pragmatic approach to resume writing and every day I love working. I mean, it's fun to be able to, um, you know, really see the feedback from people that either get a job or a bunch of good interviews and, and whatever, and, and, and see prog- progress being made, you know, because I kind of helped them a little bit. So it's fun. Well, it's great. I mean, and, and I think it's wonderful for our listeners to hear your story coming out of the the financial downturn now, you know, 10 plus years ago, because a lot of people are in that space right now with COVID-19 and to know that great businesses can come out of this and, and you can find that next thing through a crisis. Um, I think it's good for a lot of people to hear. So let's start with resumes because there's so many different schools of thought about resumes. Give me a few of your resume requirements. Like what's in a great resume for you, whether you're reviewing it from your point in HR or whether you're writing one now. The meat and potatoes is the experience. Uh, No matter what, you know, how many neat technical abilities you've acquired, no matter how, how many classes you've taken on, you know, 3D graphic design or whatever else you're doing in your world. Uh, the experience, I, I hate to tell all these early career kiddos in the world, but, you know, experience is your meat and potatoes of any sort of resume. And so the, the key is what can you get in there without fibbing, but also making a good impact as to what value you offer to these higher managers. And um, so as a old recruiter, um, I used to be the one that, um, you know, the bad practice of, I'm going to go right to the title. Uh, when I'm sifting through hundreds of resumes, I went right for the title because I'm like, well, if I need a production supervisor, if you have been doing CAD design and not a supervisory role, I'm going to most likely move on at that point, depending on the criteria. So right. um, it's it's not a good habit, but we as we are still humans and we're in a rush and recruiters can do this sometimes. Um, I think the real good recruiters recruit the candidate, not the requisition. So they're constantly networking with people putting them into a pipeline and using them for later. Those are the good recruiters. Those are the ones that aren't just worried about titles, but 
we're not talking about everybody. So you got to play the game to fit everybody. Every hiring manager is different. And so um, my, I say a few things for the resume is the meat and potatoes is your experience. Get it where it's value driven, accomplishments based, and moreover metrics added, metrics kind of inclusion uh, yeah. sentences. So you're not just saying what your task, you're saying what did you do to get a problem resolved and what was the outcome? That Those are more impactful sentences. I mean, I, can, I can't tell you how many times uh, I can't drill into my clients that um, when you're on an interview, it's all about the company. It's all about how you can add value and, 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 and tear into those pain points they have. So, and we can get into that later, but you know, for what it's worth, value, value, value. So through your experience section, have a nice layout. You don't need bells and whistles and borders and all this kind of stuff. It bogs down the applicant tracking systems. You know, when I'm trying to copy and paste your information, information into my applicant tracking system, I don't have time to figure out why the headers are all over the place and where this goes where. So sometimes I'll just kick you out of the system and say, sorry, you know, because I didn't have a time that day to do that. So you got to play it pragmatic. And then, um, I would say finally is probably the applicant tracking system buzzwords. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's a necessary evil. We don't go door to door anymore with us with our sales coat on and our in our briefcase saying, I'm the creep who wants to meet with your managers because you're creepy now. Yeah. Um, they don't want that. People prefer to go by the directions that they say, which is apply online. And obviously there's some backdoor things we can get into about how to get in front of decision sure. makers without that route. But um, just make sure that your word your words within your resume are ones that relate to your background and towards the targeted role so you're being found by the recruiters yeah. yeah you hit on something that i always it's advice i always give people about resumes go through every single line of your resume and ask the question so what and yeah. if you can't answer it if there's not a number or a you know a goal and accomplishment in all of that and that's some of the advice i also give to young people as well you might not have a lot of accomplishments that you've had in the role you had as an intern or in your first job out of college, but mm -hmm. you contributed to big accomplishments. So mm -hmm. when you go through your resume with that, so what, that so what can be your department's accomplishment. That so what can be your boss's accomplishment. You just have to explain how you contributed to that overarching accomplishment, right? Exactly. That's well put. So let's, let's talk about some debatable. You already covered one, which was design. Should you get creative or should you go simple? <laughs> Unless you're a graphic designer, stay <laughs> the heck away, please. <laughs> what, I always, what I always tell people is you can get creative as long as it plays well in the applicant tracking system. Yep. And you'll know that right away, right? When you log in and you upload your resume and then you watch your resume get put into the next page, if your resume is all wonky on the next page and it didn't go through, then you've gone too far mm -hmm. with the design. Um, but I think you can do, especially if you're in a field like marketing, communications, you might want to do something a little a little fancier than Times New Roman. But don't yeah. go and, and you can get some shades of gray and blue. You know, I've done that yeah. for some of those. Yeah. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, again, I hate to keep pounding on the graphic designers, but, you know, a lot of pink and purple. They can do whatever they want because, you know, they're trying to, really show that this is what I physically created with my design ability yeah. um, versus, yeah, like you said, a marketing person, you don't have to have pink in there. A, a solid blue will look exactly. different than, you know, the, the sales set you apart. person. Right. What's your, what is your thought on length? Um, so <laughs> I'll say I'm that. you the like hot button questions. Because so, they're all so tailored towards the person. Well, first off, if you're federal academia and research, whatever, yeah. you got to have 20 pages, play the game have every publication because I, I've, I've never per se been in the federal hiring room, but yeah. um, I'm guessing that there are somebody that's going to want to kind of skim through and make sure that they're having a, an all inclusive picture. So outside of the outliers, um, let's say you're a you know professional to even executive. I don't go over two pages because I get bored. Yeah. Um, I will s strive and fight like heck to not let that go into three. Even if my clients, some, 30 year old, uh, 30 year uh, engineer that went into leadership and he wants his 1985 IBM stuff on there. Sometimes I go, okay, here's three pages, but I disagree. But yeah. um, so I like one or two, if you're early career within five, 10 years of experience, one's usually about the stretch you're going to go because how much stuff can you really get in there? Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, one or two, again, we're scrolling these days. We're not uh, handing them in physically. Uh, we're not going door to door. So you know, the recruiter's not going to know if it is a page three per se sometimes if they're scrolling on a screen, but they know how many freaking scrolls they're doing with their yeah. finger. They don't need to be doing that much. So exactly. keep it relevant, 
and don't be redundant. Yeah. Okay, here's another hot button issue. Photo on your resume, yay or nay? <laughs> I say nay, and here's why. Agreed. Because there are so many decision makers in this process of hiring that the one or two that might get turned off by a photo, you automatically lose out on. Now, if you didn't have that photo, or, <laughs> let me say this, if you, if you have a photo and you creep someone out, you might have lost out on the opportunity. Yep. If you didn't have the photo, how many people are going to go, I'm not bringing them in. They look good for the job, but they don't have a photo. How am I supposed to know what they look like? Like, I've never seen anyone be that zany. So, I mean. I think it's a trend in Europe because I've seen oh, yeah. a number of resumes recently that have been from European candidates that have had photos on them. All I mean, of them. All of them almost. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fine. CV, if you're going for European jobs, hey, have at it. Follow their guidelines. They have a, I just got off a consultation with a client in London and I mean, it was, it's a completely different setup, a lot of stuff, but um, what matters is words. We still use the same words. So make those words impactful, make them relevant and get those people in the hiring room excited about what you can do and what, what you can Absolutely. bring. Absolutely. Okay. Last hot button issue. And this one's for recent grads, mostly GPA or SAT score. Yeah, what I say, yeah. I mean, the way I put my resume together, um, my education typically falls on one line, Bachelor of Arts, comma, psychology, comma, univer uh, University of Notre Dame. It may be apprentice fees 2020. If you're early career, you still keep the date. That's fine. Now, having said that, what I do is I put apprentices after their degree and I put in italicized font, uh, president alpha gamma omega slash GPA 3.8 slash summa cum laude, whatever I can do to get in that one line of achievements, yep. um, I will add because again, you're, you, it's not a space killer and a GPA is not taking up more than four characters. So yep. if you have the space, um, if you're, let's say this, if you're a mid-career and you had a you know, 4.0 at Harvard, you, you could consider keeping it on for the longevity because it's not taking up any extra space. But if you're early career, keep it on there. You don't have much to work with anyway. And a lot of times employers want to know your academic ability coming in from school, you know, in the last couple of years. So interesting. That's my feelings, but yeah. <laughs> so when you're reviewing resumes in a professional capacity, what are the big red flags? What should people avoid at all costs on their resume? Okay. Let's say ambiguity, the language, if you're outsmarting me, or I don't even know what the word is you're starting off with. I'm already unimpressed. I don't like people outsmart me there. I used to do this when I worked, when I kind of, was finding my voice and I had a great mentor, um, Joelle Silva, she passed away, but um, she kind of got me into that thinking like, what is bolstered? What is championed? What are you yeah. talking about here? It's increased or it's elevated. You know what I mean? Like, so she would really get me in this idea of like, I'm like, you're right. You know, like, so now if you can still sound professional without outsmarting the reader, you're kind of already in the right sweet spot for your writing. But so red flags is one outsmarting me. Two, um, weird kind of format. A visual appeal is big for me in a sense that, does this look like you wrote it pretty much on your way to work uh, at the, at the you know, uh, the warehouse and you could give two squirts about your next job. So it shows on papers, on right. your paper. Um, so uh, lack of effort, I guess. And then, um, yeah, just kind of, uh, you know, having the words that are just not, you know, starting off with the word responsible or having a ebb and flow of, of, of verbiage that, quite frankly, makes me go, why didn't you come to someone like me that does this all the time? So to you getting an extra 10 grand on the back end because you had a solid resume that led you into a solid interview isn't worth the 300 bucks that you're going to pay someone to write it for you? Like that stuff boggles me. If I got a car, like I got an HVAC issue right now. Guy had to fix my tumble or blower or some sort of thing in the blower. I don't know about that stuff. So $300 is worth the value to get air conditioning in my house in Wilmington, North Carolina in June. Um, so is the extra incentive on the back end willing to make you make the extra efforts that your competition is doing? So don't be a slouch. Hang with everybody else is doing it right. <laughs> no, I agree with you 100%. And it's, it's one of those things that I think people hesitate to pay for, but it will go so far in your career. And if for no other reason than you think your job is really complicated, right, you right. write about it like it's really complicated. Right. And the truth is most of the HR people who are reviewing these resumes don't know anything about the jobs. Right. Not, that you have to be able to explain what you do and how you do it in a way that someone who doesn't know what your job is yeah. can understand. Oh, yeah. All recruiters are marketing and management majors. I mean, I'm not a biotech person, but I can write a biotech resume now because, you know, you kind of understand this bird's eye stuff. And, and right. 
as a, as a, as a uh, candidate, you should be all encompassing and ready to speak about this to the people that relate to you, i.e. the hiring managers in the interview room. You don't need to spread it all on the resume, confuse people. That's the other thing too. There's the last pet peeve, sorry. <laughs> now you got, I, have, <laughs> no, I, I, love got it. I got 50 pet peeves. Um, when they decide to bog me down as a reader with acronyms, if you're military coming to private, yeah. if you're a technology person, save it for the end under technical skills. Don't jam in all these complicated verbiage because me as a marketing major recruiter that is the gatekeeper to, the, to your dream job, if I'm confused, I sure as heck ain't going to present it to the hiring manager because I'm not going to know what I'm talking about. So you got to keep the realization that this thing should just be a storytelling thing. This shouldn't be like a detailed, this, these are the 97 projects I've done since 06 at, at, you know, at man, at manpower on a contract job for 10 years. Like, I, you know, I don't need to know all, just keep it, yeah. keep a conceptual level. I knocked out 30 projects all within, you know, X amount of budget and, and with, with over 300 people, and move on. And then you could talk about these projects later or have a project list that you can bring in an interview and you can share later. Um, so there's various ways to get creative without being like, here's everything. You like my 10 pages? Cause I know you have nothing else to do, but look at me, um, yeah. you know, be mindful. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Make it easy for the recruiter to find you. It's, it's funny. So I formerly worked for a company whose name is very hard to pronounce. They're one of the largest companies in the world, but I always joked internally, we would joke we we're the largest company in the world no one's ever heard of. And soon after leaving that company, applied for a job that I, you know, it was one of those, you checked every single box on the job. And I knew some people internally and my job, I, I had gone through some back channels, right? And I, my resume got kicked out of the hiring process in like 24 hours. And I reached out to my, the people I knew internally and said, hey, you know, they knew I was applying and they had put my resume on the desk of the hiring manager. What was it? And one of my friends internally reached out to the recruiter and the recruiter said, well, you told me you were only looking for people from big companies. And she didn't, whoever the recruiter was, didn't recognize the name of my company. I hadn't put anything on my resume that would identify that my company was a massive Fortune 100 company. Right. And she kicked me out immediately. And my, the company I used to work for was two names and it kind of, the joke was it always sounded like a law firm. And she just assumed that I didn't have work in the Fortune 100 and that was it. Oh. Now I got in through a back channel and, and did more interviewing didn't end up taking the job, but those are the kinds of things like one line in my resume that said for a fortune 100 global firm, like that, right. you know, that teaches the recruiter who might not know the name of your company. Like think about somebody who's right, who's listening to you, reading your resume as if they know nothing about what you do, nothing about where you've worked. Right. And then, and, and just to piggyback off that, it's like, you know, some of the recruiters might dig in a little deeper and just mm -hmm. Google the company and be like, Hey, is this a large, but not all of them do. So you got, again, that's where every personality is different. They, they could have had a divorce this past week and now they're hating every candidate they come across and it happened to be your dream job you lost because they were just lacking their job that week. So as humans, as recruiters, we still have bad tendencies. So you got to play it smart, pragmatic, and hopefully it works better for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So in that same vein, when you meet with clients, Matt, and someone has a concern on their resume, let's say they've done, you know, a short stint at a company or they've got a major gap on their resume, how do you advise clients to address those gaps or address those issues that they might have on their resumes? Hire a resume writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because when I, when I approach, and this is great because I get red flags all the time and everyone's different. Not, not, I've, Okay, I've done enough resumes where some correlate, but again, everyone's so. If you're coming, let's say you got a big old gap, maybe a different different layout of the resume. Okay, there's different uh, the functional, the chronological, and, and the and the uh, function the functional chronological and combinational. I'm a big advocate of the combinational. I like having a little bit of a uh, accomplishment section above the experience, mm -hmm. and this is a little trick for the red flags. Here you go. So let's say. Um, let's say you have no relevant experience towards a job now, but you had it 20 years ago. Right. Okay. Now here's how you could do it. You could take that 20 years ago job and get rid of all that content and keep that under a previous work experience, right? With the name, yep. the date and the, the title, and then take all that stuff from there and find some really good stuff from 1985 and jam it into this accomplishment section above the experience. Now they don't need to know that was from 1985. They just need mm -hmm. to see that you've done it. And that you could still do it. I mean, don't fib. If you can't remember what the heck you did back then, let's try to be mindful of that stuff. Um, but now you can kick some of these really great achievements from down here 
into this up here. Okay, so that's like, so that's that one scenario. Another one might be um, like a gap. So a gap, what I might do is let's say someone has been doing freelance work to kind of quote unquote show that they've still been working. And even though they've been a work at home mom for the last five years, what do you do? So from this scenario, sometimes I like to do a, a, a functional layout where I'll have the nice, you know, couple, you know, whatever bullet points broken into maybe three different sections, project management, leadership, operations, whatever, and have a few different really good points. And then underneath down here, this work experience, instead of showing dates, you can just say work experience 2010 to 2020 and maybe list a few of the jobs you've done. So then that way they can grill you on the phone, where did you work? The recruiter might dig in a little bit more and figure out, but what your goal is for them is to get you on the phone so they can vet you and see if you are worthy of an interview. And once you're on the phone, that's where you can really hone in on why you would still be a fit. And you know, recruiters really itch for good talent. So if you can get them to say, okay, I'll pass you along, the hiring manager is the one that's gonna obviously be the end all be all. So if you can get to them with the resume, that's what I've done my job as a resume writer. So now you got to go and do the interview. So, um, but with red flags, I mean, they can vary so much. I think a job hopper one is the ultimate worst. When it comes to job hopping, there's a few ways. One, remove some jobs, uh, remove months. You could just do years. So let's say you had a bunch of jobs, but maybe 08 can correlate to 09 and you can lose two in between that are, aren't relevant towards your work that you're trying to do. Get rid of them. Let's show a little bit more of a seamless workflow. Don't get rid of stuff that matters though. Um, but get rid of stuff that's filler. Um, and then um, if you had a red flag, let's, uh, let's say you had a gap and um, you know, you, you're trying to uh, clump together, maybe you had 50 freelance gigs uh, and you were just mm -hmm. contracting. Instead of writing every single company, just write you know, freelance and, and you can put down maybe the company you were working for, or if it's your own business, you can put XYZ contractors. Right. And then underneath that list, some of the nice projects or companies you work for completed X amount of projects for GE, Apple, IBM, whatever, these high profile companies. And now you're kind of getting all this into this yep. and, and making it nice little neat little experience section. So, I mean, I, and again, like, did you know, uh, red flags, there's so many unique ones. Sometimes you're like, I haven't even seen this kind of thing. And so you're always kind of being creative about how to set it up. But again, this is why we do this all day. So right. we can do the thinking for you instead of you rattling your brain and then Hey, here's my one shot. I'm going to go with it. My, my cousin said it looks good. You know, he's an English major. Oh, great. And then he said, it over. <laughs> hey, have fun not getting that job. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know I mean, yeah, competitors are doing the right things. You should. Exactly. Yeah. Take the time, put the professional resources and, and time into doing that with somebody who has a, a clear view of what others are doing and what the landscape looks like. Sure. Especially cover those red flags. Yeah. So, it's interesting because I get asked this question a lot, and I'm sure you do, of in today's environment, it, you know, I just last week on the podcast, I had JT O'Donnell from Work It Daily on, and, you know, she talked about the quote we led with was, your network is your net worth right now. You know, in this COVID-19 bounce back, there's going to be a lot more jobs on the shadow market that are not going to get posted. There's going to be a lot more need to go, you know, in the back door and, and to go through your network. Our resumes, I, I, I'll, I'll ask you this just to be, you know, provocative to you, but our resume is still really that important when a lot of jobs are gotten through networking versus applying online. And why is the resume still your ticket to entry in a lot of places? Sure. Well, first off, resumes, I don't see ever going away. I mean, and maybe they'll just become a digital beast and you won't have a per se, you know, one you actually print for an interview. But again, that's so, but yeah, you need resumes because first off, even if I know you and I'm like, yeah, the, you know, Jim's a great guy. It, apparently he's got someone he knows and I've always vouched for Jim. Let's mm -hmm. get his buddy in and, and, and see if he's a good fit. Give me his resume so I at least get an idea what he's been doing. They're not going to go, yeah, let's, I'm just going to have a conversation with Jim and figure out what he's been doing for 10 years. Jim, you, you know, make sure you get a good gauge for me. You know, like that doesn't work. So you need, yeah. some, you need something to visually show them. Here's what they've been doing. And now they can go about the networking and, and, and kind of speak a little bit more personable, I guess, if they know someone, whatever it takes. But again, um, to get the picture and the place set, um, the table set, so to speak, you got to have something to show them. So yes, A, resumes aren't going away. And um, B, uh, the, the hidden market, um, I can vouch for this personally when we, after the meltdown, when, before I got laid off from John's Controls, when I was recruiting HVAC mechanics and controls engineers in California, um, we immediately halted all external posts. Hey, yep. taking down external stuff. And I said, okay, what am I going to work on? Oh, we have plenty of requisitions still, right? So they still had work 
but we weren't allowed to broadcast externally, only mm -hmm. internally or whatever, you know, these rules that get involved in an HR, which is above my pay grade. But um, so whatever, for whatever reason, as a recruiter, I was still hunting people down, yeah. but I just couldn't post it. So know this, people are still hiring, A, during any sort of downfall, there's always somebody making money, and B, the people that might not be hiring as much, maybe they got slowed down a little bit, they're still gonna have to find some gaps to fill during all this. So um, your best bet is to, um, and I find that the workarounds using LinkedIn is my favorite workaround. Yeah. Um, I like to try to find some people that might be at the company you're targeting and maybe on a level that you are or junior level within a department you're focusing on and maybe try to buy them a, a iced coffee, so to speak, online, which is kind of this thing I'm thinking, I don't know if it works or not as far <laughs> as a catchy little thing. I'm calling it iced coffee. Essentially, you're like giving them like a $5 Amazon card so you can take okay. advantage of their time. Um, so it's not a warm cup of coffee like the old days of meeting in person. <laughs> um, so, you know, you say, hey, uh, junior scientist, I really could, you know, looking to get a scientist role, a chemist role in your, uh, at your job. And you're a junior person there. Do you mind if I bend your ear for 10 minutes on the phone or a Zoom and I'll mm -hmm. send over a $5, $5 Amazon or $10 Amazon card before the call or something. Um, and then uh, pick, their, pick their brain, but be mindful of their time. Show that them show them that you might be able to add value to them somehow. Um, this this is where you really got to start thinking though. This isn't like just to you know go on a script. You know you really got to make make sure you're you're networking your way into a, a a dialogue that is relevant. And at the end, moreover, trying to just get to the next level, trying to get to a decision maker or maybe someone else in that department that can use your resume. So, um, and then after you're done with that first kind of gatekeeper, go for the second person that they might have referred you to and have, a, have an extended conversation about how you could be a viable fit and that you, you know, really research the company and notice some things that, that, that you know you can help with and you've seen some openings or whatever the situation is. Everything is under variables each, but yep. figure out some of the top ones and then follow up with them with a little bit of a, uh, maybe an incentive and then also get back to that first person. Once you're done with the second one, go back to the first one and be like, thank you and give them a little thank you and company number two, company number three, yep. whatever, keep working backdoor ways uh, to get to the decision makers. And LinkedIn is phenomenal because of how big it is as a network. Absolutely. And it's interesting when you talk about the resume not going away, I completely agree with you. I also am a huge fan of the cover letter and there are people who hate cover letters and there are people who like cover letters. And I always tell people just include it. Like if the recruiter yeah. hates cover letters, then they're not going to open it and look at it anyway. And it doesn't hurt you, yeah. but it doesn't, even if you're applying to something that so-and-so that you know at the company got you in, when they say, Hey, send over your resume, send a quick cover letter that goes through, you know, I, my favorite cover letter advice came from the former president of Hearst magazines, Kathy Black. She said, your cover letter should say three things, why you're good at what you do, how you'll help the company and why you want this job. And, well, that's yeah. it. and I love that formula, but you know, it gives you an opportunity to use some pros in a way that you don't get to do in the resume. I always tell people put the cover letters in, in with your resume and if nobody opens it, darn, but if somebody loves cover letters, then they'll love your cover letter. Yeah. Because that one who did like it might say, I don't want to see them now. They didn't give me a cover letter. I didn't get a chance to see how they, they write yeah. or whatever. And you're, and that's saying what you just said, exactly what I tell my clients is that eyes only belong in the cover letter. Eyes, me's, we's, us. You don't put them in your resume. You don't put them on your LinkedIn. That's your cover letter is your personality. And that's the one where you can actually say me, 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 me more than, you know, anywhere else in this whole job hunting process. So you got to have it. So let's talk a little more about LinkedIn. One of the questions that I've heard a lot lately, you know, we hear tips from resume gurus. And of course I give this tip to tailor your resume. And make sure that your resume is tailored for every single job, that you're matching those keywords so that you get through the systems. How does that advice jive with the fact that we only have one LinkedIn profile? So you tailor yeah. your resume, you change things on it, but your LinkedIn profile has to remain static. So how do you walk that line or advise clients to walk that line on their LinkedIn? Sure. And I will be the first to admit that I'm totally on board to hear other experts with LinkedIn as it evolves into the beast it is and the entity that we're all using it as. And, and First, I always say, A, your LinkedIn should match your resume because when I was a recruiter, if I had a profile of someone that didn't jive with the resume my hiring manager had, and all of a sudden we have two of the same Jane Doe's, but it's the same person, but two different, like, we're, we're, yep. don't do that to people. They have a hard enough time already hiring, and they're already in a busy, hectic manner. Um, so keep your resume and LinkedIn the same. It's fine. I don't, you don't need to get cute with LinkedIn. 
It, it's not a Facebook. Um, and then now, moreover, and that's just how I feel about that. So <laughs> I know I get excited about that. Um, but moreover now, this, this point, and I'm just going to give you my two cents, but again, I would like to hear everybody else's in terms of, of who's been through this. Um, but um, I would say that you want to master your, your LinkedIn profile around whatever the, you want to emulate your link, LinkedIn profile around your master idea of a job, your, your master target. Your, if you're a marketer and you're open to marketing, sales, and management, which, which one do you want the most? And that's kind of where I would say is my first knee-jerk kind of answer. Just make it marketing then. Don't try to be the jack of all trades or Jill of all trades because that's the biggest no-no. Um, maybe in the 90s, but nowadays they want niche. They want people that are functioning as one type of thing. Um, unless it's a small company that wants and embraces that. But let's just be mindful that you want to be more niche than broad. And so I would say pick your best one and just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, now, LinkedIn, I would say um, it is important to have it and have it completely filled out and have it auto-populated on each field because A, visibility matters with recruiters looking for you on LinkedIn. So fill everything out because you get higher up. And then yep. B, auto-populate now, which is fantastic that they do this because if I'm a recruiter and I need to search everyone who's ever worked at Johnson & Johnson, I'm gonna click Johnson & Johnson. That, that's all the auto-populated Johnson & Johnson people that get found, not, not you that typed it in. So yep. those are my two takeaways um, with LinkedIn. Um, I would say, and the final thing I would say is use the endorsements to find buzzwords relevant to your industry and your job. Because people that are doing the role already that you want to be in, they have plenty of buzzwords at the bottom under the endorsements. And LinkedIn's doing a wonderful job trying to standardize all this crazy buzzwords yep. out there. So use that with the job description buzzwords as your two places to find uh, those ATS words. But yeah. that's your thoughts on LinkedIn in general. Those are fantastic tips. I think the buzzword thing is really helpful. Uh, this is going back 10 years ago now when I was making this switch from nonprofit to corporate, I had, you know, at that time, all of your skills and endorsements, everything was fundraising communications, fundraising communications. I actually went back and asked a bunch of people who had endorsed me, will you endorse me for these other three skills that will get me in some of those jobs? So when you log on to a job in LinkedIn or you look at a job and it says you would be in the top 10% of this of, of this job if you applied or the top 20% or the top 50%, that's looking at those endorsements and skills and, and what's there. So if you know you're trying to make that shift, ask your friends to endorse you for the thing that you're trying to make a shift to. Absolutely. And then the other thing that I, I always tell people, you know, and everybody's resume, like you said, is a little different, but generally how, how I've formatted resumes is maybe a line or two that explains what you do in the job followed by those accomplishments because you want that line or two don't put the accomplishments on your linkedin that's kind of how i feel about linkedin put the line or two of what the job is on your linkedin and then tailor your accomplishments for every single job that you apply to but then your linkedin that top level stays the same the accomplishments might change it drives me crazy when i go on somebody's linkedin and every job that they have on their linkedin has eight paragraphs on it it's like no 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 like I want two sentences on your LinkedIn about what that job was. I like that idea. Yeah. Very, lots of, lots of ways to use LinkedIn. Lots that's, of you know, and that's what I mean. It, it's just getting more and more like, all right, how do we as coaches kind of give them the good advice that they need? And you know, that, and that's the thing as long as, again, I always just go back to pragmatism. If you're not crinkling the forehead of the reader, you're halfway there. Now you just got to be the match of the job. If, if they're not confused with when they're looking at you, um, if you're a match, you're going to get in the interview room. I mean, it, it, now that they actually have you in their, their yep. radar. So. so a lot of people right now in this COVID-19 crisis, you know, like you did in, in you know, the financial downturn are reevaluating their careers. And a lot of people are getting laid off and maybe they're looking for a job that's kind of the next linear job or a lateral move for them when they've been laid off. But a lot of people are probably saying, you know what, I got laid off. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do something else. How do you advise those people to switch industries, totally shift careers? Um, how do they, should they write that functional resume versus a, a linear one? What are some of those tips and tricks for people going, I don't want to be a, you know, supply chain manager anymore. I want to be in marketing. Sure. Uh, first off, congrats, because the hardest part is convincing yourself and actually wanting to take the steps. So, um, if you have that, that gut feeling, go for it. But um, know this. I just wrote an article about this like two weeks ago. because I, I had a Zoom where I got fired up over this. <laughs> um, if you want to go and be the marketer, don't start applying to jobs. Don't just go and willy-nilly your resume. 
you need to learn because you've been in supply chain for so long. You need to learn what are marketing trends. What the heck are marketing words? What are marketers doing? What's marketing? What what are we doing for like? Go and study, research the industry, research the role, research what cog you would fit into the wheel that is the company. Research it like you are going to be on a Zoom call talking about marketing. Then when you get there, write your resume. So how do you do that? You you either a you go through Google news alerts. You set up stuff about um, you know uh, top companies that might be in the marketing world or top you know, firms that have great marketing brands and figure out who they use and what are they doing and tactics and, and really and, and hone in on the key players and the key stuff that people are doing in that world and figure out where you want to fit. Then you got to figure out, um, you know, is there opportunity for this? Do I have a logical chance of getting paid by someone to execute this service? Because there's a lot of people that have been doing this for a while already out there working and trying to find jobs. So what value, again, going back to value, what do you bring to these people? So um, if you can research the industry, the roles and, and, and the companies, the players, all that stuff, and then try to start, like you said, then start filtering into this resume, then start adding to what continuing classes did you do? Did you get on Allison.com or Coursera? Did you go to Harvard that's offering mm -hmm. free Ivy League classes online right now? Did you do any of these things where it made you better in that marketing world? Get that stuff on the resume. Yep. Um, and get the things you learned in there on the resume. If you learned email marketing and MailChimp and all that stuff, get that on there because now you're starting to collect. You're collecting these little um, these little skills and achievements and, 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 and aptitude. So then once you formulate this plot of what you can put on your resume, that's when you decide what kind of resume. And that's where you hire us because now you got to get a resume that's going to go and beat out 50 other marketing people that have been doing marketing for 10 years at the competitor. And they're the ones that everybody wants. So, but there doesn't say you should not stick to your gut and know that, hey, this is going to happen for me and have that belief and make it every day, all day, the quote unquote all day, you know, work day of being a marketer because now you got to put yourself into the shoes of this new world. So you better learn it. You better know it. You better demand respect in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, you're, so. right. you're right. And I think especially for someone who, if you've been, if you're in a situation where you've been laid off or you're between jobs, reach out to, you know, your buddy who owns a business that does lawn care and say, can I write a marketing or a social media prospectus for you? Can I have some, you know, can you give me some feedback on this so that you've got some sense, even if it's not paid freelance work, find yourself some freelance work that will get some of those skills under your belt that you might need in that job you were looking for. Absolutely. And I love that freelance because uh, literally, it's my wife did after the meltdown. She went from technical writing at 99 cents only at corporate headquarters to hair and makeup artists and doing film and TV. And she had to do free stuff for like yeah. two years because she needed to get a resume. And that's what I did when I, I kind of moonlight in the acting world. And those first few years, I didn't get paid. No one's going to pay me. To, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. So you go on student short films. You go and do feature, local feature films. You go and meet people and network. And then eventually someone will actually pay you. <laughs> Absolutely. So, It'll you're surprise right. you one day, right? Yeah, experiential <laughs> learning. They're nothing better. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this has been so great, Matt. I know our listeners have gotten some really good tidbits from you. We will make sure to link your social media and your website so that people can find you and hire you um, and ask you more questions about resumes. This was fantastic. And thank you so much for coming on Office Baggage. Oh, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you again. And, and uh, everyone be safe out there and uh, uh, stay well. So 